I'm here to talk to you about trustworthy software, which is, I'm sure is what everyone wants to understand at this hour of a uh, morning. But nonetheless, I'm going to keep going uh, and uh, I shall try and get finished roughly on the time that I'm due to finish. Uh, so um, if I look as I'm going to overrun, I'll start running really fast, which will may make it even less possible to understand what I'm talking about. So one of the things I'm going to say is that we're using the, something called the traffic light protocol here. Um, some of you may or may not have come across this. This is an idea for information sharing. It came out of the UK National Infrastructure Security Coordination Centre back in the early part of the, of the 2000s. Uh, and we standardised it as an ISO standard. And because I work in the ISO things, I like to throw this in more as a gratuitous way of publicising something I like. So ISO IEC 27010, 2012 establishes the, these things. Things that are white you can put on the internet things that are green you can share with virtually anyone but please don't publish on the internet and amber and red are more sensitive things there's a couple of slides in here that we haven't publicly announced on the internet yet which i've marked them green to give you a little bit of practice as to how you use a sharing protocol so what is this thing? It's all to do with a cyber ecosystem, but I don't like the acronyms that exist. People who've known me for years will know I do love inventing acronyms. So one of the acronyms I've invented is a four-letter acronym, because I've run out of three-letter ones to invent. And it's called the IOCT environment. Why do I say that? Well, there are three distinct digital technology realms that people sometimes don't understand are intrinsically interlinked. The first one is information technologies. Now, this is the one everyone kind of gets. It's the computer that looks a bit like this thing. Uh, and as such, uh, it, it's relatively easy to understand. There's also a set of things that are referred to as OTs, or operational technologies. Industrial control systems are a classic example of this. Um, once upon a time, an industrial control system had a very specialist little sensor, a piece of cable, and a specialist console that looked after it. Nowadays, it's a reconfigurable programmable sensor, a Wi-Fi link, and a PC. So the way in which these modern industrial control systems differ from uh, information technologies will be, well, um, in practice, they largely don't. Some of them may be in interesting types of enclosure, like a railway signalling system, but actually most of the components that build them are identical to the ones used in IT. And finally, we have things called CTs, consumer technologies. We're not just talking about internet-connected fridges, which people remember from about a decade ago, when I nearly had to buy one for various obscure reasons to see how it worked, um, but w most people in this room will have a smartphone. Those devices were not designed for the corporate enterprise environment, and yet we're plugging them into the, I the IT realms or the OT realms as controllers. Mm, so you have a whole blended environment there, so actually to talk about anything other than IOCT may not be terribly helpful. Uh, and they all carry out roughly the same functions, which are processing, storing or forwarding information. So we actually then need to consist what do these IOCT things consist of? Well, the thing I care about is called software, but it is intrinsically interlinked with other things. So you have a logic-based hardware, things that are actually controlled by ones and zeros. You have uh, the environment, um, things in particularly the electromagnetic environment. If we're relying on a Wi-Fi link, we're kind of relying on the fact that no one's contaminated the radio spectrum. You also have the wetware, the soft, squidgy thing sat in front of the computer doing the things that are probably wrong. Um, you have processes and the physical that surround uh, the uh, environment. Uh, and also you have, of course, the information contained within it. All of these are factors that are, as is shown here, are intrinsically interlinked. You even have non-logic based hardware because uh, things that are on analog tend to be controlled using analog to digital converters. So there's uh, this link into various other forms of electronics. There is an extended supply chain that works worldwide for most of these things. Very little that you come across is actually made in the UK with a nice little uh, logo stamped on it. And the whole cyber ecosystem does need to consider the, the, the totality of these things that we call slooping. What I say about the, 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 the software role, it's, is it clearly defined? Is it just the thing that sits between hardware and software? The, uh, hardware and wetware, rather? Well, the, the human being is a controlling mind function that, uh, that controls things. That seems to make sense. Only nowadays we're getting autonomous systems. Autonomous systems that are going to be making decisions for themselves. So the function that used to be performed by people is now being performed by things in the form of software. On the other extreme, you have the, the hardware. We've always had the interesting conundrum of what do you call um, firmware? Is it hardware? Well, it's definitely hard. You can push it. Is it software? Well, yes, because you write firmware. Hmm, so that one's always been a bit blended. Another question is digital logic circuits. 
Has anyone come across how you make an FPGA or an ASIC nowadays? Do you do, do it all by hand or do you use a programming language? Well, actually, hardware description languages are used for all of these things nowadays. So that thing that looks rather hardware is actually largely software. It's, it's all to do with the fact that this is a somewhat blended entity, is understanding where the limits of software are. We also have the concept that um, the biologists are now trying to get in. The act. They have come up with something called genome programming languages. Um, now, many of you will have seen Godzilla movies in the past, where, where for some reason some giant monster arises. You can come up with one in, in a few years' time where someone puts a comma in the wrong place when programming a genome and ends up with a monster. And by the way, if anyone actually does come up with that movie, I want the royalties because I've been sa saying this idea for years, so it's not Hollywood's idea. <laughs> A lovely quote we, uh, we came across um, back in 2006 when I was doing some earlier work on it. Uh, software development is improving, now it's merely abysmal. Last year I thought on, on its 10th anniversary to say he was right. Um, unfortunately the quality of much software is less than can be desired. Um, because we all have come across computers that work perfectly all the time and nothing ever goes wrong, haven't we? Uh, at GM practice that would be very, very untrue. You may or may not be aware of this statement of ethical principles published by the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering and the Engineering Council. Uh, it applies to anything that you make, engineering being basically to do with anything that you make, in taking technology and making it actually usable in uh, a, a human environment. And it brings out a number of the principles, which I won't bother reading over, but two of the things that we do like to concentrate on is that you should actually, in all things, try and make it trustworthy whilst taking due consideration of risks. So, the underlying question is, would you argue that the most software is trustworthy with due consideration of all likely risks? Or are there things that the economists would call moral hazards arising, whereas people developing software are letting their consumers suffer the results of their lack of trustworthiness? Um, I have a view, many other people in this audience may have a view, let's just carry forward at that point. A challenge we have is that very few people treat software, uh, treat adversities holistically. You end up with people who, who say they do information security. They can concern themselves with something called threats. Threats are somebody who has an intent and a capability to do you harm. Um, it's a little bit difficult to do with things like the, the uh, fam famous Donald Trumpsfeld-esque not Trump, Donald Trump, wrong one. Rumsfeld, that's the one. Donald Rumsfeld's known, known and unknowable unknown problems, which wasn't actually some bizarre thing invented by US politicians. Uh, it was actually a, a perfectly good piece of research that came out uh, about five years previously from a, a respected epidemic. There are things that we literally don't know about. Therefore, if they're a threat, how can you quantify them? Because you know neither their intent nor their capability. This is, is rather difficult in terms of mathematical modeling. You also have an entirely different community called safety or systems reliability. These people care about what they call hazards, which are completely undirected. Yet actually they tend to have much the same effect. Things going wrong randomly, things going wrong because people have attacked. Why do we actually care? The trustworthiness approach is largely intended to try and break down these stovepipes of thinking. What you don't need is to actually look at a safety critical system and say, ah, but since we're only doing safety, we're not going to worry about whether someone might try and hack us or whether you have a security methodology that says, well, we've identified some hazards, but since we don't do safety, we don't care about them. These will be not taking that uh, trustworthiness approach that is recommended by the Statement of Ethical Principles, but is actually putting on a set of blinkers that are not needed. So what we actually try and recommend is, tr is working towards a holistic approach to adversity. Um, what we actually say is adversities is effectively the set of both threats and hazards, that you have a look at all your risks, try and establish trustworthiness by aff affording appropriate protection. But is that what happens in principle? Well, in practice, well, probably not. What you actually find is you get these stovepipe thinkings going on. You have people talking about their hazards, focusing the, their goals being safety, and they tend to talk about dependability. You get the threat community, again, saying they are, are seeking security by applying defence metrics. We've got an interesting little question. What about faults? They're kind of neither a hazard nor a threat. They're somewhere in between. So who's responsible for them? Uh, certainly in some organisations you actually do have a safety team and a security team. Uh, and, and both go, well, that's the other guy's problem. Uh, and it's a little bit of a problem. Our idea of trustworthiness is it's the superset. What we say is you need to look at four, five factors. Safety, reliability, availability, resilience and security. 
the degree to which any organization cares about those different factors will vary, but someone should at least, as part of their underlying risk assessment process, try and consider all of those factors. Um, we have in several cases come across people who say, oh, I don't need safety, don't need security. You've never ever come across anyone who says, I don't need availability. Because then their chief financial officer comes wandering along and goes, hmm, well guys, so you're actually spending money on this technology, this IOCT, that you don't care if it ever works or not. Will you please stop spending my money on this stuff? So in practice, we believe there is actually no such thing as no requirement for trustworthiness, which aligns back to that thing of, of linking back to the ethical principles from the Engineering Council. But you can have this whole spectrum of, of, of where adversities may arise from. Uh, and this is a little thought exercise we, I did with the uh, US Department of Defense a while back uh, to try and show that uh, some things may look the same but be regarded as entirely different. Uh, for instance, if we look down, uh, the, the, the grid is set up such you go from technology through to the information to the actual customer focus uh, and whether it's a hazard or a threat. Um, some things don't fit very neatly. For instance, if we look, and I'm hoping this is a laser pointer, it is indeed. Oh, not a very good laser pointer. Nonetheless, if you look down this axis, threats and hazards, I've talked here about inter uh, electromagnetic interference. Obviously nothing whatsoever to do with software, but part of that slooping uh, environment I talked about earlier. Accidental things could be things called coronal mass ejections. This is things coming off the sun that cause radio frequency interference. At the other end, anyone who's ever seen the film Ocean's Eleven will know there's this thing that blacks out Las Vegas so they can rob a bank. That's called intentional electromagnetic interference. Actually, the interference is identical. There is literally no distinction, but one is a threat and one's a hazard. So treating one and not treating the other, or ignoring one and <laughs> paying a great deal of attention to the other may be less than intention because there's no distinction. The treatments are the same and, and, and the phenomenon is the same. You also can get some rather interesting questions as to where malicious software comes. Mm. If it's targeted and, and very sophisticated against the military, it's probably what's called a computer network attack. On the other hand, there's an interesting question, is generic malicious software, is it a hazard or is it a threat? Well, the threat says you've got to have some intent. If there's no particular intent against you, there's a capability with no intent, multiply anything by zero. Ooh, mm, interesting mathematical problem there. So we end up with things that are actually collateral in the middle. Uh, and, and so this is quite, quite interesting to try and look at the spectrum of, of things we might need to uh, deal with. What we've tried to do here, I mentioned the fact that we have this SRAS acronym, Safety, Reliability, Availability, Resilience and Security. People also be well aware of an older one called CIA, Confidentiality, Integrity and Availability. So I thought one of the things we tried to do was map them together. Well, one of them it does appear to have a 100% mapping. Availability mapping to availability is probably not a difficult mapping to achieve. Uh, I think we can all largely agree on this. Um, if you look at security, what we're typically saying that means is confidentiality of, of the information. Um, the integrity property is interesting. It actually tends to flow across a number of things. It supports safety, availability, confidentiality and uh, reliability. The one that actually doesn't fit very neatly is this chap called resilience, which is assume that things won't be perfect. We do risk management, we don't do risk avoidance, so things will go wrong occasionally. Have you thought about how to recover when it goes wrong? Not assuming it won't, but actually how to recover. And that's a property that is dealt with very little in many environments. You may have things like, you say you're sponsored by Southwest Warp. A warp is a form of, of the response side, but how do you actually have the resilience to recover as well? So this is our definition of, uh, of trustworthiness, uh, and these are the, de the definitions. If anyone feels the need to read them, um, anyone who's ever read uh, a book by Ian Somerville called Software Engineering, which he's been publishing in multiple editions since uh, I can't even remember when he pressed the first edition. Remember, he defined dependability. What we agreed with Ian is we take his old dependability definition, which is safety, reliability, availability, and security, and blister resilience into it to make our trustworthiness definition. So if that looks a bit familiar to some people, there is a reason why. And I can see a couple of members of the audience actually nodding in recognition of the tome in question. What goes wrong? What goes wrong with the software world? Well, quite a lot. We don't necessarily have a, a, a very good figure for it. Um, the last study as to what the, the, the deleterious effects were was carried out by the US National Institute of Standards and Technology. This was 
quite a long time ago. Uh, in fact, I think it was 2003. No one has actually done anything in the US or worldwide or in the UK since. There, the figure was about $60 billion US, 2003 dollars, from software going wrong. This isn't the, uh, the how much electronic attack figures. This is the cost of people sat twiddling their thumbs because the computer has crashed. If you had less time with uh, computers crashing, then maybe your stuff would be more productive without actually having to spend anything. We know from a vast variety of studies, uh, in particular there's something called the Chaos Reports that came out of the uh, University of Oxford, uh, that they, uh, bad software is a very major cause of IT project failure. Um, the, the hardware isn't available yet isn't a refrain you hear all that often. The software doesn't work or isn't available yet is a refrain that we've heard all too often, or it's not doing quite what we expected. Um, there, there are some rather interesting scenarios, in particular in the uh, operational technology field, where um, due to the safety mindset, um, it is working in a very, very safe manner. For instance, signaling, railway signaling systems that, because they can't figure out the conditions when installed, decide to switch every light to red and leave them there, which um, is very safe, but does have the property of not actually delivering that availability we were talking about. There was a figure from the UK government cert a few years ago which actually said 90% of IT incidents are down to bugs, things that were avoidable. Not people doing terribly sophisticated attacks of a very sneaky beaky nature, but just exploiting a vulnerability that has been around for many years in the public domain. I think if we updated that figure today we would find that has not changed. It is actually uh, the, the recurrence of the same problem time and time again is, is very much an underlying theme. Uh, in the USA, there's a, what's called an, another, here's a five-letter acronym, but not one of mine, an FFRDC, Federally Funded Research and Development Corporation. There's a plethora of these, the US federal government funds, one of which is called MITRE, uh, and it runs uh, something called the Common Weakness Enumeration, or CWE, which is a list of uh, distinct weakness types. Um, not a specific weakness, but something very generic like the word buffer overflow. Um, there's 706 standard things that we know go wrong. Um, and as a, when I gave this presentation last in the USA, the MITRE coordinator said, ah, but there's also three chains and five composites. Please put that on your slide. I can't remember quite what the, the distinction with his chains and composites are. Nonetheless, just know there are a lot of things we already know goes wrong, and it keeps going wrong. It's the same thing happening time and time again. Uh, the buffer overflow is the example of that uh, I can see a, co a colleague of mine grinning away in the audience because he's heard this so many thousand times before. Nonetheless, the buffer overflow, uh, you've, you've seen it. The reason you need to update and patch software is because of a buffer overflow in XYZ. Interesting question was when did it first happen? As far as we can trace it, the first known occurrence of a buffer overflow was in a computer called the Leo One. The Lions Electronic Office, the first commercial computer, basically Lions Corner Houses were the equivalent of Starbucks in the 1950s. It ran inventory rather than computation. They had a buffer overflow in 1953. It's quite a few years ago, really, yet it's a class of thing we're still getting wrong. In engineering, and I'm a hardware engineer by training, um, we try not to make the mistakes we knew, knew about 50 years ago. In fact, you generally get done for negligence if you build a bridge not taking a, a account of sidewind loads. Many people have seen the Tacoma Narrows bridge swinging side to side and falling down. No engineer since then would have dared build a bridge that would have had that failure mode. Yet, software, we have bug, buffer overflow still happening 63 years later. This is a sign that the industry is not very good at learning its own lessons. So how do we treat it? Well, I'd like to introduce you to something called a bow tie model. This comes in from the, the realms of safety, um, where you have the idea that you have preventive controls, an upset, and then some recovery stuff. Um, and as I said, we, we need to look at the idea of adversities, including both the hazards and the threats. So what you end up with is this concept. That you have proactive controls, reactive controls, and being pre prepared to respond, response preparedness. Within the reactive side, which is the one most people know less about, you need to think about the recovery, which is that resilience property, uh, and also potentially the investigation and disruption thing. And that is the one thing which is unique to the people who care about threat. Um, no one else other than the, thre the threat community care about investigation and disruption. But everything else, you do need to take a, a holistic view of, of hazards and threats.
So let's have a yet another. I use it in my notes. I do like doing my sets. Here's yet another one of those familiar Venn diagrams coming up. This is to try and look at the life cycle where we consider it and actually understand how what we're talking about in trustworthy software links into other assets of management. So we, we say that we are on the we have a, a simple life cycle. Many people who know something called ISO IEC 15288 know that there's defined 11 stages of a system's life cycle. Um, that's rather too many to bother with. So we actually say there's three fundamental activities. You're specifying things before you start doing it. You realize it, you make it, and then you use it. Those are the three big chunks, and you can actually delineate them this way. So you actually have the idea of a trustworthy software management system kind of bef largely before the fact, more to do with specification and realization, various in-life management systems right, for the use phase, and some stuff that sits in the middle, things like verification, deployment, configuration, validation, and maintenance, which kind of sit on the boundary between the two. Um, that's our focus, is very much the, the first part, uh, and the, the aligned domains, as we say, um, focus on the stuff in red. Um, and those domains, well, of course, they can be safety, reliability, availability, resilience, security. And, of course, we, we end up with some splitting in terminology. You get people who talk about information security, get others who talk about cyber security. Uh, and uh, there's no consensus definition of what the distinctions are. I have my own definition, but I won't bore you with that because that's not my purpose today. And what the word quality quite often creeps in, but there's a certain aversion in section in a section of middle management at the moment to the words quality because they got burnt by something called TQM or Total Quality Management in the 1990s, which became a giant self-licking lollipop. Uh, and, and therefore, we've been trying to avoid using the word quality for many years. And there may be others. I'm not going. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. But things are not going to get any easier. We have a whole load of factors uh, going on um, that mean that uh, th things are not going to get any easier. Um, there's something that in my ISO standardization work we call di distributed application platforms and services, or DAPs. Because why use one word, cloud, which is what the rest of the world uses, if you can use five? Because in the standards world, we do like to make very long expressions. Internet of machine and machine-to-machine -machine interactions, mobile devices and lightweight operating systems. This is that consumer technologies penetrating into the, into the enterprise and industrial worlds. The use of bring your own devices. Again, the consumer technologies, people liking their smartphones much better than that old Blackberry the company gives them. Commoditization in closed architectures. Uh, this is the, 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 the move of, of reconfigurable things into industrial control systems. And even things like consolidation for energy efficiency, the, the green agenda, uh, where we're virtualizing, means that all of these things are actually increasing the degree of dependence on software compared to where we were, say, 10 years ago. There is a challenge as to why we find it quite an uphill struggle. How many people in this room, I can see there are some relatively young people around, remember the year 2000 fuss? Unfortunately, we did quite a good job with the year 2000 and nothing went wrong. That meant to a lot of people, they said, well, nothing happened when you made all that fuss in, in, in the late 1990s. Therefore, clearly, it was a complete waste of time. It is what the challenge that's known as the insurance sale challenge. You're, you're, you're actually asking to do something so that nothing happens, which is, uh, for, for people who care about the bottom line, somewhat difficult to, do, to understand. Part of the problem was it was somewhat, the year 2000 was somewhat oversold by the press headlines. I, I picked on some examples there. Um, although some academics actually did suggest try and take a little bit more of a nuanced view than it's all going to go horribly wrong, guys, um, that didn't necessarily work terribly well. Um, and therefore went into a whole crying wolf problem. Um, at the time that this happened, actually, I was working for the Ministry of Defence. I still do in a different hat, but um, I was, uh, I remember sitting in the year 2000 cry current commitments team, which is where we were ready for anything to go wrong. About 35 people waiting around all night for nothing to happen. The only thing we could report to our minister was tide gauge in Portsmouth rather than Plymouth Harbour does not work correctly. Is reporting that it's actually the tide height uh, in 1900 rather than 20,000. Answer, revert to manual which is the big rulery thing that many of you will see on the side of dock. But literally that was the only thing we, that we hadn't got right. It's a swings and roundabouts problem. We actually did, that was, year 2000 was a success story that is regarded as a crying wolf problem. And we have to get beyond that.
The requirements for trustworthy software basically can arise, as I say, from multiple sources. There are people who explicitly ask for it, but there's a whole chunk of it which comes from something known as NFRs, the non-functional requirements. Implicit needs that the customer never asks for, but the delivery o o operator in some way should actually consider. Um, in mainstream engineering, when you're building a bridge, you tend to actually think mm, things like strength. The customer never asks for how strong it's going to be, the engineer is responsible. Somehow the software industry isn't really quite as good at thinking about the things the customer hasn't thought of asking for. And as I say, it has to apply to that whole IOCT domain, my four-letter acronym from earlier, and the whole range of activities, specification, realisation and use. The degree to which we care about it ranges anywhere from due diligence, which is anything, you know, angry birds, you probably just would like to keep your high score. If you're designing a flight control system for an aircraft, you probably want it to be a little bit more trustworthy. There is that whole de question of degradation within it. So, and how do you choose the degree of granularity in which you can have? Well, is there a single answer that fits everybody? Well, it tends to stifle diversity and innovation. A single answer book with some exception conditions. Well, that's what virtually every call centre in, in the world deals with. They only want to give you one answer, but if you really push and ask to speak to a supervisor, they may give you a second answer. <laughs> then somewhere in the middle is what Aristotle used to call the golden mean. Uh, an appropriate set of answers. Uh, not too many, not too few. Uh, the Goldilocks zone, if you will. Uh, you can have much more variety, but that starts to get into a problem in many cases of combinatorial explosion of trying to actually test everything that could go wrong. And finally, you have what's sometimes known as the special snowflake syndrome. Every single thing needs to be treated separately and individually. Fascinating, but actually virtually unachievable. There is something many of you will come across, I hope, called the Pareto Principle, otherwise known as the 80-20 rule. Um, the idea of a sweet spot where less, only about 20% of the effort gets you 80% of the success you want. And so what we're trying to do with coming up with ideas for trustworthy software is the things that achieve the most benefit in, in, in the uh, minimum uh, amount of effort, sometimes known as the vital few. We have to accept that for any large or complex system, um, the, such a thing as perfection is probably unachievable. Uh, in fact, in many cases, you can prove it to be mathematically unachievable, uh, the complete absence of defects. Uh, the combinatorial explosion problem I mentioned earlier, you end up with interesting things that these are what is uh, known in the business as complex dynamic systems. Complex dynamic systems to a mathematician is a euphemism for the word chaos. Uh, and chaos doesn't quite mean what the general public means, it, ha is a, it actually has a prescribed meaning within mathematical modelling. And you end up with properties that are emergent, you'd never expected them to happen, but they arise anyway. The idea of God good engineering principles nonetheless can be applied. Try to minimise those set of avoidable defects. Do not have the buffer overflows that we knew about since 1953, uh, using the Pareto principle as to which ones to select. I basically treat software like any other engineering activity. I'm, a I'm an engineer, I say things like that. A problem we face is the fact that the software supply chain is not monolithic. We identify four primary clusters, each of whom regard things differently. You have a mainstream software industry, people who do this stuff for a living. They will have quality manuals, procedural manuals, coding standards and various other things up the yin yang. You've then got niche markets, uh, people who do very specialist software, flight control, firewalls, things like that. They may forget about the, thing, the other side of the coin, the hazard versus threat thing, but at least they do tend to understand it. Uh, Small-scale developers, man and dog in shed, or person and dog in shed to be more uh, diverse, um, <clears throat> unlikely to have a 70,000 page quality manual because there's literally the one person. Uh, they need to have a different message. And finally, you've got a whole chunk of people who don't even think they do software. If you develop something to control the brakes on a car, you think you're an automotive engineer. If you write some formula into a spreadsheet, you think you're a user. But nonetheless, you make the same errors that when I used to program in Fortran, calculation errors in a formula in those days was a programming error. Now a formula error in a spreadsheet is, um, well, I'm not quite sure what you call that, actually. It's just something going wrong. Uh, so there's this whole question of how you target these different communities. And we do believe there's sort of a gap lurking behind it of people who actually think about it holistically. Um, a tiny percentage of the niche community may do, but most people don't. In the UK, we have been trying to look at this trustworthy software problem for quite a long time, amongst a number of communities, as itemised here, between government, industry, academia and the professional bodies. 
Uh, <laughs> You probably can't read it on these slides, but there's a list of the acronyms. We carried out a series of government-led ad hoc studies about 10 years ago. I said when we started looking at it, when I started looking at this, the buffer overflow problem was only 50 years old, not 63 years old. Uh, that led to the formation of something called the Cybersecurity Knowledge Transfer Network Secure Systems Development Working Group. Don't you just love these acronyms? And that concluded that actually, mm, yeah, it's not done very well, by the way, in the UK. And by the way, many academic institutions actually omit to teach it in the majority of their degree courses. Um, if you do a specialist degree in something like what would now be called cybersecurity or trustworthy uh, control systems, it probably gets mentioned. If you look at the more general degrees in computer science or electronic engineering, probably glossed over entirely. We had something called a secure software development partnership, working with industry to say, what would we like the future to look like? Um, from that, we also worked with it multinationally and developed a roadmap of what we thought the future should look like. And that led to the formation of what I led for a few years, what was originally called SSDRI, an acronym too long for me to even bother it spelling out for you. Latterly, Trustworthy Software Initiative, government funded to try and come up with some good principles. Um, we formed something called Advisory Committee on Trustworthy Software to keep us honest, to make sure all stakeholders' interests were uh, accommodated. And we even published some stuff, which we call the Body of Knowledge. And then we formed something called the Trustworthy Software Foundation, which is what I'm here as today. Here is a roadmap. I'm not going to go through all 25 cells of the grid. Um, nonetheless, this was what industry, uh, academia, and the international community said, would they like done? So we made a big list of it. Okay, five streams, how to adopt it, the body of knowledge needed, making sure there's coherence between various things, in particular the vast variety of international standards that don't necessarily pay any attention to each other, safety versus security, for instance. How you achieve training, education and awareness, and how you verify that things have been done. And that's been the focus of what we've been looking at. Over the few years that we ran the Trustworthy Software Initiative, uh, we tried to build all this stuff to address those five facets I mentioned earlier. Safety, reliability, availability, resilience and security. Um, we published a major comprehensive framework as a British standards publication, PAS 754. Um, that's a, a short life quick document. It's Currently, I'm just literally just starting next week to update that into a full British standard, which will be 10754, due out roughly this time next year. We also said, focusing on this idea of Paretoism and having str simplified versions for the less onerous requirements, we published something called a Trustworthy Software Essentials. Trustworthy Software Foundation was founded to keep things alive. Um, it's uh, predominantly to maintain the body of knowledge, but also to uh, address other aspects of the roadmap as we can. And part of what we see our role as being is to point to diverse but obscure practices, uh, sources of good practice. And I'll come back to that in a minute to illustrate why. We're currently owned by a number of professional bodies, uh, one of which is, um, funny, the ISP, who are talking to you later. Uh, and we are hoping to bring most of the other major professional bodies in the realm on board later. Uh, the marketing idea is we have this segmentation. You have three different chunks. A mass market with an implicit need, that's your Angry Birds stuff, Mass market with some more explicit needs for trustworthiness. Banking apps, you probably would like it to look after your information and keep the balance right. And finally, these sort of high security things. So we have this idea of a spectrum of trustworthiness levels, each which maps into things. So we have trustworthiness levels of zero through to four. Zero us being less likely for reasons I mentioned earlier. The size, well, people keep asking us, how big is this need? And the answer is, I have really no idea. But I produced a pretty picture, because people like pretty pictures. So here is a log scale graph, which means close to nothing. Because the problem being, the uh, very low requirement of trustworthiness, um, apps for smartphones, is so vast that everything else would vanish if I used anything other than a log scale. Market size doesn't really matter. We're up to the log, 10, log e to the 35, so we're talking billions of things. Um, I, I, I have had many uh, fruitless conversations about market size because it's actually one of those pointless activities trying to quantify it. What we do need to do, though, is to try and standardise how we carry things out. Um, there's a quote from Henry Ford, who you'll all remember standardised making cars on the colour black. Actually, he never did any such thing. But the mythology has to persist whether or not it's true. The important point he know, said is you standardise what you, you currently believe to be good, but you have to evolve it. Things cannot stay still. Uh, very important point to realise. 
I mentioned we have these trustworthiness levels. Um, here we have the idea is you take a whole load of parameters, carry out a risk analysis. You may come out to the left-hand side with a zero requirement. Chief Financial Officer is getting very excited because of zero availability requirement, but nonetheless. Or you may say, not a huge need. We can use this idea of an essentials approach, pres very prescriptive. Or we can go to a niche view that is um, going to be just intrigued as to what happened there. Something odd happened on the screen. Uh, uh, or the more niche view where you augment existing practices from um, our catalogue as defined in the PAS, soon to be British Standard 10754. I mentioned that we have the idea of signposting. This is the idea to illustrate why we need signposting. Um, for very senior managers, we have a, a high level of abstraction. We say there is something called a framework. Next level down, we say mm, there are some things called technical controls and six other control sets. Next level down, we have groups. One of the things here we might have is something like choosing appropriate tools. That's middle management friendly, 30 of those. And finally, we actually have the full control consensus. We have 150 things listed there. And that's where we talk about nasty, techy things like programming languages. Um, but the signposting thing, why do we need signposting? Well, it's where all the good practice exists. This is a signposting exercise, a list of things, not a how to do it thing. Sitting out there is things like, say, look at programming languages. There's a document here. ISO IEC 24772, <laughs> Guidance on Language Selections. Tells you the problems you're going to have if you use C or C sharp or various other things. I'm reckoning with about a 99.99 degree of confidence that nobody in the room other than myself has ever heard of that standard. This is the challenge. We have a whole load of good knowledge out there, but no one knows it's there. In the three years I've been using this slide, I have had two people in the audience ever put their hands up. The two people who put their hands up were people who were UK contributors to that particular ISO standard. This is the problem we have. No, it's not that we don't know how to do it, it's no one knows where it is. We're going to try and help you with that. You will see that there may be a degree of synergy with the cybersecurity realm. Uh, people may be well be aware there's something called ISO IEC 27010 uh, and the cybersecurity essentials. Therefore, we see that what we've built be matching sets earlier in the life cycle the PaaS and the trustworthy software essentials. We also produce some little videos um, that uh, try to tell senior managers why they needed to patch, which is that thing that sits very much on the border. And uh, oh, I put it in there. Yes, we are going to update the PaaS uh, there. We also need to check that things have been done in a sensible way. Um, the components, the practitioners, organisations, instruction, advice. Uh, in order, if you, if you don't have people, people who know what they're doing, organisations who care, and things that work, you won't end up with trustworthy software. We've focused largely on uh, verification, uh, which is looking at conformance, not validation, which is does it meet my need, because there's no way of generically saying whether anything meets a person's needs. Um, we did do some work in, in, during the Trustworthy Software Initiative things uh, as to how it would work and proved it can work. Uh, we've now finalised some stuff on verification assessments and are looking to carry out a pilot exercise in the next few months uh, so to define how you would actually verify things for specific domains. One question people do ask is what will impact, I mentioned standards, how, what impact will we, there be of Brexit? Well, as it says, we are going to leave. This is the official statement, but at the moment we haven't left, so everything stays as it is. Um, interestingly, the slide I wanted has gone missing. What it was actually going to say, I said something odd had happened in, the, in this thing, is that uh, most of the standardisation activities, although we might do them in a European forum, do not actually belong to the European Union. They belong to things like the Council of European Posts and Telecommunications Entities, ETSI, the European Telecommunications Standards Institute, is nothing to do with the EU. Neither are SEN and CENELEC, two of the other standards bodies. They, uh, they belong to um, the EFTA Foundation. So it's unlikely that Brexit will materially affect anything we actually talk about. So uh, I think that neatly takes me up to the amount of uh, time I had.